Asalaamu Alaikum, everybody. Um, my name is Shadia Igram, and I am the Executive uh, Director of Muslim Space. Um, and I welcome you all here today, Ramadan Mubarak. And my apologies, first and foremost, that my end is going to be a little haphazard. I'm doing my best here to, um, I'm going to moderate, but I've got a few distractions in my background, which is why my camera is off. Um, inshallah, this will go smoothly. Um, I wanted to take a moment here, though, to welcome you all to this event, this Ramadan Halakha. It's a three-part series titled Women and Gender in the Quran. Um, it will be led by Dr. Celine Ibrahim, author of the same titled book, Women and Gender in the Quran. Uh, as a little background, Dr. Ibrahim and I have been talking now for over a year, and we finally, finally uh, got to put something together. So I am extra excited because this has been um, on my wish list now for uh, pretty much 13 months. Um, and we here at Muslim Space are actually huge fans of her book. Some of you have participated in this kind of school year's um, Quran reflection series where we meet once a month and we discuss different characters, uh, female characters from the Quran. And it, the information and the discussion is really rooted in Dr. Ibrahim's book. So those of you who have attended the program I think we'll have um, a little bit more familiarity if you haven't read the book before uh, with her work. Uh, speaking of her work, just a very brief background because I don't want to take up too much of the conversation. Um, Dr. Ibrahim is joining us from the East Coast. Uh, and I, I just want to read her description on her LinkedIn because I love it so much. Um, but she is a scholar of Islamic intellectual history, religious studies specialist, experienced educator, chaplain, and theologian. Um, I encourage you to go to her website where you can um, read her uh, more about her um, experience and expertise. Currently, she uh, serves as the denominational counselor for Muslims at the Harvard Divinity School. And she also is on the teaching faculty of the Groton School, which I had no idea about until I went to their website. And I have to say, it sounds like an incredible school. Um, I definitely wish that I live close where I can enroll my children because that sounds, I mean, maybe you can share a bit about that, but, um, wow, mashallah, super awesome. So as I said, um, Dr. Ibrahim has written the book, women and gender in the Quran. And she also recently, um, published another book called Islam and monotheism that was published in, uh, 2022. So Dr. Ibrahim keeps herself very, very busy, mashallah. Uh, and without further ado, I would like to introduce her. As a reminder, we will be um, fielding questions. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of her talk, at the end of her presentation. You are more than welcome to put your questions in the chat box, um, and I will either field them to her or we can open it up, and you're more than welcome at that time to raise your hand, um, and we can call on you, and you can just ask the question directly. Um, and so with that... Dr. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Shadia. Mashallah. Thank you for the work that you do with Make Space and the beautiful uh, community that you've been building. It's my honor to be here in these middle 10 days of Ramadan, inshallah, this Sunday and the next two Sundays, inshallah, through the end of Ramadan. So, Dr. Shadia, once again, thank you so much for, 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 Stella Shadia, for putting this together and uh, for the whole team at Make Space. Ramadan Barak to everyone. May our prayers and our fasting be uh, acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah, wa ala ahlihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Inshallah, may we have benefit in this time. May we... Um, use the time to purify our hearts and our intentions to take us through the, the rest of Ramadan, inshallah. So I've set my intentions, inshallah, for this study, and I invite you to set your own at this time to be able to Im, uh, have the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resonate in your hearts, in, inshallah, to have our intellects in, stimulated by the beautiful words of the, the Quran, and uh, in particular for this topic having to do with uh, women and gender, May we use it as a way to strengthen our communities, to, to strengthen our ability to be, as the Quran says, awliya, 
um, to one another. And I, I invite you just to take a moment to add your, your own intentions as well, inshallah. Uh, so in my work, I'm looking at how the Quran can speak to the believers. And I'm also looking at how intellectually we can engage with the Quran and ask, what does it tell us about how to understand sex and sexuality and gender? So I want to try to re-emphasize through my work the role of women and girls in sacred history, both the sacred history that, that comes uh, into the Quran from before the Arabian context and the sacred history narrated in the Quran from the Arabian context itself. So this week, we'll focus a bit more on some of the stories that come into the Quran from the pre Arabian context, and then in the next two weeks, we'll be focused even more on the, 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 narr the narrations and the figures that come into the Quran uh, based on the, the context of the Prophet وسلم, in the seventh century, uh, or our first, our, our first century common era. So, or first century Hijrah. Sorry, my Ramadan brain, I think, is kicking in a little early. <laughs> So my other hope is to offer insights on our contemporary ethical questions and to think together about our own growth and spiritual reflection through, through the Quran. Uh, so we will have a Q&A at the end, uh, as Sharia mentioned. So I'll go through about 25 or so minutes of presentation, and, and I look forward to your, hearing your questions. One perspective coming from the Quran that is so absolutely essential, I think, to the understanding of both gender in, in terms of social roles and sex in terms of biological um, makeup of, of humankind is this idea of this one soul that the Quran repeats several times. So nafs is, of course, could be soul is one translation. It's also used in the Quran to mean like an individual, an individual human being. You know, most of the verses of the Quran are, in fact, addressed to generally uh, human beings. They're not addressed to either males or females. They're, they're addressed to, to a human being more generally. Uh, and the Quran makes this beautiful link between this, this one soul and uh, and the abdomen of mothers, and if you if you think about it, what's the the link? Let's get a, a, a English translation. This is just one potential translation, right? We're always we're always in in the realm of of translation. It's obviously not exact, but I wanted to, you to note that the soul, the nafs, in Arabic grammar is feminine, and so there's even a a link uh, potentially between this gendered soul that is feminine and it is divided then into create the rest of humankind. So this, um, this verse is one of many in, in the Quran where we see. And if you look at uh, the context of this verse here, it's all about um, humility and about recognizing the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so if we find ourselves in a paradigm where someone in front of us is trying to assert that one sex is better or, or than another, we can see it as a real breach of humility on that person's account because we are the creation of Allah. Allah created us from, from one soul, created from that soul, uh, her mate. And uh, it, anytime we move into a paradigm of gender hierarchy or gender superiority, we're arguably moving away from the, the humility that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to, to have in contemplating the, the, the wonders of the creation. Uh, so the, the Quran also gives us this beautiful uh, reason for creating the human being as um, in this pair, this, um, in this spousal dyad, uh, that such that uh, such that we can find rest in in each other, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala established the the muadda and the rahma. Muadda obviously coming from the Arabic word that that's uh, wudud, meaning loving, and um, rahma here also obviously coming from the the root that also means womb. 
So there's a, a loving compassion, we, we could possibly say, um, between spouses. And so this is the, this is the ideal. And uh, we could say that it's an ideal that not only uh, pertains to the exact like spouses in, in marriage, but we can also think about the as wedge, yes, being, being referring oftentimes to male and female, uh, husband and wife in a marriage, but as wedge also simply can refer back to being created in, in pairs. So there, there could be a double entendre here uh, to mean both. Uh, so, sorry, my slides are not advancing. Okay, there we go. Uh, again, the, the, the things being created in pairs, not just humankind, but other things, the Quran talks about as a dhikra, right, a reminder of the, the benevolent majesty. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the samad, the one without kufu, the one without partner, the one who has no division in, in human for human beings and other things, we we need help to to reproduce. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the khalaq, the, the creator, uh, needs no partner. So even our being created in a gender or in a sex, I should say, is um is in contrast to Allah so that we can realize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's might and, and majesty. Now, there's a lot of discussion when we come to the Quran about uh, there's spiritual egalitarianism between spouses, but is there other types of egalitarianism in, in the Quran? One of the things that I like to do in my own work is to look at the um, linguistic occurrences of words and patterns in the way the Quran uses words. And so one of the interesting things that came to my mind, and I've counted many times, I would ask you if you'd like to count yourself just to check me to make sure that this is right. But the root word for father, so not instances in the Quran that only mean father, but words like forefathers, etc. But the root itself occurs almost the exact amount of times as the root for, for mother in, in the Quran. So we have, of course, the verse that I like to call the equal opportunity verse, where all things are for believing um, men and women, submitting men and women, et cetera. So this, alongside many other verses in the Quran, gives us a good sense of the spiritual egalitarianism of, of the religion. Then there's other subtle clues that we can read into the, the Quran. So for instance, when Bilqis, uh, Malikat Saba, the queen of Sheba here, comes into Islam, her, her words of coming into Islam, first she does the tawbah. Um, she does the tawbah, you'll see, just like Musa in the very next surah does the tawbah with that exact same formula. And then she submits along with Suleiman to Allah, Lord of the worlds. So she has realized that Suleiman can probably outdo her in a military sense, but nonetheless, she doesn't submit to Suleiman. Uh, she submits with Suleiman to the Lord of all the worlds. So here's someone who doesn't have a theological education in Islam at all, but she understands that she doesn't worship another human being. She, she worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we can even see here from the example of, of Bilqis that she doesn't uh, play into a, a gender paradigm where she is less than, than Suleiman. One of the questions I get frequently as a chaplain is with all the emphasis on men uh, or uh, I should say Muslim uh, males receiving um, heavenly rewards in terms of virgins in paradise. The question often comes to me then, well, what about what women receive? And I wanted to just point out this is one of many verses we could look at on this issue. Uh, but the, the Quran says that no, here we have this general word, nafsun again, right? This is not no man. This is not, you know, this is nafs, which is uh, inclusive of all of humankind. So knows what's hidden for them. Again, 
if this is, though it could be a masculine plural, meaning men in general, the most often use of this in, in the Quran and the most likely meaning of it here would be just in general, um, them as in a, a gender inclusive. So of, um, of we can say Qurat al-Ain, delights, consolations, joys, etc. And so even the way that the, the Quran talks about heavenly rewards is typically in this form that is gender inclusive. When it comes to the hur, uh, hur'ain, grammatically, we just could translate it, or grammatically, it doesn't have a, a specified gender uh, per se. So it is just a uh, general description. So we could say even the immortal youth, potentially those are also wide-eyed beings in, in paradise. So we just based on what the Quran uh, tells us about this paradisal realm, may Allah give us firsthand knowledge of it and shouts this, you know, that the wide-eyed is typically, you know, a symbol of, of beauty and that all beings would be beautified in, in paradise, not simply feminine um, beings. Now, another way I'm, I'm going through various themes in the book sort of quickly. So I welcome us to delve into any of these themes and the questions and answers. So the, the Quran doesn't give an archetype of women that, that all of its women figures fall into. We have old women, young women, um, devout women, treacherous women, uh, married women, unmarried women, women with kids, women without kids, all, all sorts, women with husbands, without husbands, you can, you can go on and on. So in a way, it, it gives a landscape of what is possible in, in terms of all the different permutations of, of life experience. So the examples of, of damned women in the Quran, there, there are three of them who are explicitly damned. There's at least 19 other female um, figures who are alluded to directly mentioned that are uh, otherwise named as pious. So the damned women are actually a very small portion of the entire population of, of the Quran's uh, women figures. An interesting little tidbit about the wife of Abu Lahab in the revelatory order of the Quran, she is the very first individual woman mentioned. So we do have verses that talk about the one soul and about um, this as wedge, but when it comes to a single kind of character figure that we can identify as a discrete woman in sacred history, these verses are likely among the 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 first, the, if not the very first, that mention a woman figure. So it's a very stark message about the nature of arrogance, both for a uh, you know male figure who is also arrogant and his wife a female figure. So there's a even the first uh, example that the Quran mentions, it mentions a female figure who's at the same moral status as, as her husband figure and mentions the gravest, we could say one of the gravest, if not the gravest sins in, in an Islamic understanding, which is to be, to be arrogant and to be, you know, willfully in, um, in denial of the, the, the beauties of the Prophet Muhammad and Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we have another woman here who is, I think many times if people think of a woman in the Quran, she's one of the first people that comes to mind, maybe second to Maryam alayhi salam. A little tidbit about the wife of Zulaikha, who I spend a lot of time in the book talking about and how, talking about how her example is relevant to us today. But the very root, Zalakha, in, in Arabic means to slip, uh, a, a slippery place, et cetera. Uh, Interesting enough, given the story, given that Zuleha um, you know, really closes the door emphatically, uh, apparently this, this word can also mean the sliding bolt to, to fasten a door. But she's also, she's only called in the Quran the, the wife of the Aziz Misr or, or, or some combination of, of that title. We don't have Zuleha named in the Quran. So it, it could be that this is a, um, you know, the word comes to match, her name comes to match her circumstances, or it could be the, the other way around. 
but she's a woman, I think in the Quran, while we focus sometimes on her temptress qualities, as the story unfolds, she, um, she does eventually admit her guilt. And so in that way, she's a model for us for if we've um, committed some type of shortcoming and have not taken full responsibility for it, she's a model in the Quran for, for how to do that, you know, whether we're, we're men or women, girls, boys, et cetera. Um, it, it does, she's a, an example, I think, um, for all of us in, in that regard. Um, there's plenty more to say about her, but I, I won't, I'll save that for another day. Um, I just did want to say a quick note about beauty in, in the Quran. So this is a hadith from Sahih Muslim and talks about the beauty of Yusuf. Most people are very familiar with this particular hadith. And I wanted to just call to mind here that the Quran speaks about Yusuf as, as one of the, the muhsineen meaning having this quality of ihsan. And here, this is these are passages from the study Quran, the translation. So here's a possible translation into English as the virtuous. But interestingly, we have the, this word also coming in relation to Maryam in, in the Quran, who's also raised in this beautiful way, uh, et cetera, who embodies this quality of, of ihsan, we could say. And so there's a um, there's a parallel, an interesting parallel that the Quran has between the figure of Yusuf, who is also wrongly accused of some type of sexual immor immorta immorality, and the figure of Maryam, alayhi salam, who is also kind of publicly accused of a sexual uh, imm immorality, and how very. Um, interesting that the Quran is emphasizing that there are people of, um, of virtue, ihsan, but there, this the word also means beauty. And so the, the Quran oftentimes uh, will talk about moral, we could say moral beauty. And I observe in the book that it doesn't talk about uh, features of women and doesn't emphasize aesthetic beauty at all in, in relation to women, which is so very counter to our popular cultures where the there's a tremendous pressure on women to emphasize aesthetic beauty. And uh, I think as Muslims, one of the ways we understand what we're doing in terms of embodying modesty is to say that the virtue, you know, virtue, be beautiful virtues are more important to us from an Islamic framework than, um, than aesthetic beauty. We don't have to negate aesthetic beauty, but we do have to prioritize, in, inshallah. Uh, so let me, let me skip over this now. I can maybe get to more of the Zuleikha story, in, inshallah, if people have questions. In the book, I, I look at this instance between the the two of them as an instance of sexual harassment, sexual assault. And I think it's a good way to talk about the story in the modern world, especially as we're kind of collectively as, as a, a society and beyond in the US and beyond thinking about the pandemic, we could say of, um, of, of sexual harassment. And uh, it's, it's fascinating that the Quran gives us a story that speaks to this issue that has plagued humankind uh, for, for ages. And so it's a impetus maybe for us as Muslims to think about the many ways that we could get involved proactively on, on this issue and the ways that we can support people who are healing or um, trying to navigate their way through spiritually, legally, um, emotionally, any other ways, uh, this, this very difficult issue. When we come to the sacred history and we look at where the Quran begins in terms of telling the arc of humankind, we find that not only is the, um, this concept of original sin not in the Quran, which would have been part of the 
the milieu of the um, ancient Near East, the Mediterranean world at the time, this idea would have been um, prevalent in, um, in uh, the societies that were influenced by Christianity. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran puts the words of the Tawbah, relates them directly from Adam and Hawa together. So Adam doesn't speak in the Quran except with Hawa. And given that the, the Tawbah is the, arguably one of the most important prayer formulas uh, in, in Islam, you know, this act of continual repentance, it's one of the core spiritual practices that we do as Muslims daily, hopefully many, many, many times a day. The, the fact that we have both a woman and, and man figure doing this together says a whole lot. Uh, we also have this beautiful meaning of the word hawa, um, you know, in, including that this uh, idea of comprehension, a place that comprises, comprehends a thing, um, et cetera, also to gather together, collect, unite. So nothing in the Quran is, is um, you know, superfluous. Uh, we, we don't know the name of, of Hawa, obviously, from, from the Quran, but just the fact that, that, that coming from the, he the Hebrew, Hava, we, we have this beautiful name of, of our foremother as just something to dwell on here. Uh, I did do a podcast on Hawa for Zaytuna a few years ago for Ramadan. And um, I had encouraged people to check it out for more on this story and the meaning of repentance and the, the role of the female figure there. One of the th other things, in addition to counting numbers of occurrences of words and looking at patterns of words, another way I enjoy studying the Quran is to look at the structural parallels between surahs. Those of you who enjoy academic readings, and Naveen Rada from the University of Toronto has done beautiful work looking at Surah Al-Baqarah. Uh, she has a book uh, out looking at the structure of Surah Al-Baqarah. But one of the things I noticed in doing my research was that in addition to many of the other structural parallels and thematic parallels between Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah Al-Imran, we have these two types of these two instances of verses in the exact same place, you notice the verse numbers that undo this concept of a woman being responsible for the fall of humankind. And then in this verse here in Surah Al-Imran, which we'll look at in a second, are these this pair of verses rather, um, affirms the value and worth of the girl child, which throughout human history, female infanticide has been you know, one of the, the horrendous crimes of, of humanity against women. So the, the Quran speaks to an ideological instance of, um, of disrespect for the, the female females for women. And here is a um, practice that is widespread throughout cultures and throughout history of devaluing the the girl child and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there's a, arguably a structural uh, connection in in these two surahs in the way they treat uh, um, the the en endemic issues of of chauvinism so we have here these these is the Quranic verses in which the mother of Maryam, who's not named in the Quran, but who um, is known in the Islamic tradition uh, by, by several different names, including Hannah, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But this phrase from the Quran, I've seen it used in contexts that unfortunately are very, very chauvinistic, but arguably in the way it's used in the Quran, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is affirming that this child who has been dedicated by a very pious woman to, to the temple is deliberately a female child. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, as the Quran says in many instances, knows exactly what's in, in the wombs. And so we don't have to interpret um, this verse as giving uh, superiority one sex over another sex at all. It's just recognizing that there is a difference. And interestingly, this reflects some something of, 
of human nature too. So for instance, it's very common when uh, a woman is expecting a child, people want to know, oh, is it a girl or a boy? Like this is the first question a lot of people ask. And uh, I just find it very um, a very fascinating reflection of the nature of human psychology that the, the the Quran would also kind of pick up on on this thing that we do as human beings as wondering uh, as to the gender of uh, or the, rather the sex of the baby. So if we look at just spend a moment here with the, the mother of, of Umm um Maryam, uh, the wife of, of Imran, we see that she is uh, incredibly pious, you know, has an uh, offspring and a grandbaby that's uh, incredibly pious as well. And one of the things she mentions uh, in her prayer to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, truly you are the hearing, the knowing. So let's get, oh, go back here. Uh, uh, sorry about that, I'm finding it. Oh, I don't put the Arabic on here. Um, is it that I didn't? Oh, there it is. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Uh, so this is what she says right here. Uh, the hearing and, and the knowing, meaning potentially, you know, hearing of her dua, and also knowing, knowing kind of the, you know, the, the circumstances that this child is going to be brought into. Now, fascinatingly, the Quran in the verse just prior to this verse talks about God choosing Adam and Nuh and um, Ahl uh, Ibrahim and Ahl uh, Imran above all the worlds. And then the, the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, tells us, Wallahu Samil Alim. And so Allah tells us God is hearing and knowing. And then right away, Maryam's mother, Umm Maryam, right here, in her the end of her prayer, she prays to Allah by these exact same, same words here. So the, the Quran in this verse, in this verse, we don't have mention per se, you know, we have Adam and Noah, Ibrahim, Imran, right? But we have this very subtle point here of the house of, of Abraham. Ahl. Um, so it's, you know, Imran doesn't appear at all in the Quran. You know, who represents the house of Imran in, in the Quran? It is the, the, you know, this blessed matriarch who is the, the Umm Maryam wa jiddu, jiddat Isa, inshallah. That's uh, the correct grammar there. So uh, the, the grandmother of Jesus. So who else, as we think about the Qur'an uh, and the way the, the Qur'an uh, gives us an understanding of our sacred history, other than the Prophet ﷺ and the other prophets, who else uh, endured hardship, faced criticism, and labored to bring you know, the word of God into the world? Uh, here's a little clue down here, if you can, can see these letters, Kaf, Ha, Ya, Ayn, Saad. Of course, Maryam alayhi salam is described, right, Isa is described as Kalimatullah. So the, <clears throat> the speech or the, the logos, as they say in ancient, um, in ancient Greek. So we have um, a woman figure physically birthing into the world, Kalimatullah. So we have male figures that give revelation and we have a female figure who is received word from the angel. By the way, that verse is 1919 in the Quran. So if you ever need to look it up quickly, you can just remember 1919. Uh, you can also remember that there's 119 instances of the, the root um in, in, in the Quran. Um, so the Blessed Mary at the climax of her labor you know, says again, this phrase that really parallels the, the human experience of labor. If you've ever been in labor or seen someone in labor, you realize that, that it is, as, as the Quran describes it, a, um, a trial, uh, a hardship, um, something you know, that, that, that happens to, to uh, you know, a woman where her entire body kind of takes, uh, you know, has to uh, 
um, put all its every ounce of energy behind this particular um, task. So the the way that the Quran talks about this is with tremendous uh, esteem to to the mother figure. Sometimes this word is translated uh, as pain, uh, but we can also just think about it as as hardship or um, struggle, really. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has has given this very unique form of um, of jihad to to women who have to. Uh, endure, you know, not only this moment of of delivery itself, but you know, potentially the whole pregnancy has different kinds of um, hardships to it, as well as tremendous joys as well, of course. Uh, so let's go, let's go to look at another instance of uh, that that relates to women and child birthing in in the Quran. Uh, here we have Sara. Notice that the Quran refers to her, the angels call her uh, with the term Ahlul Bayt. Of course, we probably know this term most um, prominently to refer to the, the wives of the Prophet وسلم, But just as the Quran makes this connection between Ahl Ibrahim and uh, Ahl, Ahl Muhammad وسلم, we have here this connection between the um, Sara being um, honored as the, you know, kind of the, the family of the house of Ibrahim, right? The wife, Ahl can also mean directly wife, like specifically wife. And so just like we pray in the Tashahud um, for blessings on the family of the Prophet Ibrahim and the Prophet uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we, um, we have here in, in, in the Quran a reflection of the esteem given for, for Sara. And we also see that the way the Quran tells stories, sometimes it's focusing on uh, the, the male point of view as in some of these verses focus on Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam, and some of them focus on the reactions and inner states of uh, Sara. So we, we have both perspectives represented in the Quran. Uh, though the Quran tells stories of um, primarily prophets being the, the central protagonists, we can look and see all of the different mother figures, sister figures, wifely figures, um, just like the, the Prophet Muhammad himself, who has, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who has many mother figures and wet nurses, uh, etc. Um, Musa, alayhi salam, is also a, a figure who has many, many women uh, in his milieu. And so before he can get about the business of saving um, the Banu Israel, uh, he's saved many, many times from all of these different women figures in his life. Uh, we also see that, that Umm Maryam السلام, receives um, wahi. And this is an affirmation that the Quran gives of the ways in which the, the hearts of of uh, women can be um, open to to the um, you know the the subtle messages that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives, and here we see that she understood the message right away, and even if it was asking a very very difficult thing of her, akin to maybe the sacrifice of Ibrahim, we could we could make a parallel here. She has to throw her child in the river which is almost like of giving him up for, for death. And yet she trusts the guidance and trusts that, um, you know, that if she does this thing, she doesn't need to fear or grieve. Obviously, this is a very hard uh, commandment if we take it as a commandment, right? Fear not nor grieve. How can a mother who's just not unsure of the uh, fate of her, her child um, you know, not fear or grieve. But I take this as a message maybe for us in a contemporary sense, like so many of us who are mothers, I remember very, uh, very vividly, the feelings of putting my daughter on the school bus for the first time. And, you know, I wasn't throwing her in a river where they're you know, at, because people were trying to kill her or anything like this. But just the amount of maybe uh, trepidation, just sadness, 
that, that I felt in that moment kind of makes, gives me a little kind of experiential awareness into to what this could be like. Uh, and of course, we know in the contemporary world, many people have to either give up their, their children for, for one reason or another, or, you know, send them across a national border or, or, or the like. So once again, we find the Quran telling us a story that not only tells us something about sacred history, but tells us about how to orient in, in the present moment. So just like we can look at Zuleikha and, and Yusuf and that whole circumstance and, and think about helping people heal from the, the trauma of um, sexual harassment or sexual assault or abuse, we can also think about these verses as calling us to think about those families who have been um, separated because of national policies, because of war, because of um, whatever it is. And whether whether we are those, whether we've had those experiences in our lives and we're reading the Quran and seeking uh, solace from this, from, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's um, careful care for, for one of his beloveds, we, we can either empathize with people in this situation or find a way through if, if we've been in the situation itself. I, I know very soon I'm preparing to send a child away to college. And so I'm also thinking about these verses and in that sense, sort of sending them out into a crazy wild uh, world out, out there. So uh, may Allah SWT guide all of our, our youth, inshallah, and, and ha and inshallah, the, the upbringing that we've given them as parents is uh, sufficient, inshallah, to carry them through. Uh, so we see here that the, as I just suggested, the many women figures are working to save Musa and even his sister here. It's a beautiful example in, in the Quran of sisterly love. And here's like the quintessential big sister figure. Uh, so, you know, those of you who who have um, maybe big sisters in, in your house, these are beautiful verses to, to show that level of responsibility that this sister carries. And these lines are made all the more poignant in that uh, the stories that the Quran tells about brothers tend uh, not to be as flattering in terms of the moral character of the brothers and the treatment to their siblings. And I'm thinking here of the use of narrative. Um, so we can, you know, even this story could be a, a good example for a big brother as well for how to um, take responsibility in, in a time of, of need. And, you know, whether it's small as in, you know, maybe uh, watching a younger sibling you know, while, while a parent cooks or something like this, or it's really big, um, you know, whatever it is, may, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, make our young children good siblings to each other. And as, as we age too, we, we may we be um, good siblings for each other. Uh, by the way, she's also very smart, right? Like, look at this girl who just in the blink of, you know, in the moment under pressure has to come up with this plan to get the infant Musa, you know, back with, with a less uh, guidance, of course, orchestrating the whole thing, but she plays a very vital role in knowing uh, exactly what to say. And whether that's one part intellect and one part Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like guiding her and inspiring her, and, you know, either way, it means that she's a, a, a very astute and um, uh, kind of like a role model for for all of us in in that regard of of true wisdom how to how to get a thing accomplished and in in a very uh, expedient but honest way. So um, I mentioned this very briefly, but when we think of of stories of obedience in the Quran, maybe the story of of Ibrahim alayhi uh, salam, you know, sacrifice being ready to to sacrifice his son comes to mind. But we can also think of Umm Umm Musa alayhi salam as a a, a parad paradigmatic figure of obedience. Um, so just you know, kind of putting it out there for consideration. Um, the Obviously, Imrat um, uh, Faraon plays an important role in being able to rescue Musa from her husband's uh, machinations. And 
she has this beautiful dua in the Quran, which is uh, the last words spoken by a female figure in the Mus'haf. So as you're going through the Tarawih, listen, uh, listen for these words in a, in a few, um, in a week or so, and you'll, you'll see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places the beautiful speech on the, the word, the, the mouths of women all throughout the Quran, but the last verses end in this beautiful speech um, for the wife of, of, um, of Pharaoh. The other sister figures in the Quran are, of course, those who Musa السلام, meets at the watering hole. And here's an example of a sister figure who is, um, or rather a daughter figure, who has a beautiful relationship with her father. And I oftentimes hold up these verses here as an example for our young people or when they're trying to find a suitable spouse and you know involving families and the like so if we look at these verses she's taking a proactive step in you know finding someone she doesn't just you know kind of sit back and like oh maybe someone will come along my way you know she's she's very much hey here's a person she recognizes his character is is qawi you know this could appear this could mention be reference to his physical stature it could also be a reference to you know his his um strength of character for, in, for instance like the word um beauty right it, it has both a, a literal meaning and a meaning in the realm of virtue ethics and trustworthy, right? What more do we want in spouses than than being um, trustworthy? So, mashallah, it gives us a good, good, uh, you know, whether we're men or women, males, or females, whatever, we we have a, a good guidance for what to look for in, in a spouse from from one of these these two women in in Medzian. Uh, one more note on this: we also see the beautiful negotiations between her father and Musa salam, and uh, you know both are very accommodating and very lenient but have a, a very respectful dialogue so it it shows I think it's a Quranic example of how we shouldn't be um, you know like oftentimes my Muslim students will come to me when they found somebody and say but my my family won't accept them because they're of the wrong ethnicity or they're do the wrong profession or or whatever so um, inshallah make us people who marry our children based on the virtue of the spouse and not for um, you know primarily the virtue of the spouse inshallah so I think I'm going to stop there I'm going to show you some of the upcoming slides to give you a sense of what we'll talk about inshallah God willing next next Sunday and the Sunday after that We'll look at how the stories of the Quran relate to the Prophet وسلم, in the spiritual struggles that he's facing and his early community is facing. We'll look at different Quranic social reforms through which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects the female concerns. We'll we'll look at this concept of like justice, adil, and how do we see the Quran um, insisting on um on uh, women, what we could call women's rights in um, particularly in the Medinan period where a lot of the legislation begins to be uh, formulated. We'll also look more specifically at, at the, the Ahlul Bayt, uh, Ahlul Bayt Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Here's another uh, nice mnemonic device that the, the or nice uh, numeric device the Quran gives us to remember. If you ever want to know where the the Quran mentions that the Ahl al-Bayt of, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you can remember it is verse 33, 33. When, when Allah Subhanahu wa says that the Quran is uh, um, easy to remember, maybe this is one of the ways, inshallah, some of these key verses have um, easy to remember numbers. We'll also look at the, the slander of Aisha and the, the affair of the lie. And we'll look at different what I'm calling case studies where we have a uh, guidance that, that comes down both to the community of the Prophet وسلم, and by extension our communities. So here of course we have uh, in in um in Surat al-Mujaddala this uh 
strong affirmation of a woman's um, complaint against her spouse. So I'll I'll end here for today. Inshallah, I'm very, very curious to hear your uh, your questions, but also feel free to just reflect with me. What what lessons did you hear or reminders, or maybe those of you who are studying the work uh, found something useful that you want to bring to, to the attention of, of the group. I um, thank you for bearing with me with a little bit of Ramadan brain. Uh, mashallah, hopefully this, this session will help take us a little bit faster to, to the iftar time, inshallah. Um, I'm, before we go into the Q&A and I stop uh, sharing the screen here, I did want to put up my email. I usually tell people, give me a month. And if I don't respond in a month, then send the email again. Sometimes I get um, occupied with my teaching responsibilities or, or family or the like and can't answer right away. But I usually do try to, to answer. And um, you can also, you can contact me at, at email or there's a contact at the that, um, that website that I check. Um, somewhat regularly. I also wanted to say if you don't have the book and you'd like to pick up a copy, this is my family and friends discount right here. So that means you you get the the book at the same rate that I would get the book at if I would go to purchase it. And so I'm ha very happy to have the work out there in in circulation. So please do feel free if you you this this code works at the University Press website itself. So just um, it doesn't work on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or anything like that. You you do have to be on the the Oxford University Press website. And um, there we go. We can stop share. Okay. Oh, Jazakallah. Thank you so much. That was that was fantastic. And um, as uh, like I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> you know, we've gone through a lot of the figures in the Quran. Uh, sorry the female figures that you've mentioned in your book, um, in our monthly discussions. And I love, it just reminded me of so many, so many of the discussions that we've had, um, on these women and how they've moved the Quranic stories along of, especially the prophets. Uh, so beautiful. We do have a few questions already. Um, and again, I'll just remind everybody, um, to feel free to put either drop your questions, um, in the chat box or just raise your hand and we will uh, call on you. You're more than welcome to voice your question directly. But um, to start off, the first question we have is, uh, it says that sexual abuse that women suffer is often attributed to the lack of moral restraint on the part of women. Um, and the only example of sexual assault in the Quran is that of a man by a woman. What mm -hmm. to make uh, of, of it as you yourself ask in the book? Yes, as I've as sat into the story now over many years doing chaplaincy and unfortunately, you know, having to see this issue up close in, in the context of my work as a chaplain, and then just kind of contemplating on the ways in which uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the story in the Quran, in which Allah ta'ala raises the issue in, in the Quran, but doesn't if people who have experienced sexual assault, who may be just based on statistics, would be women who have experienced sexual harassment or, or sexual assault um, from a male perpetrator. This is just the more common ways, although we know, it, you know, sexual assault doesn't have to be male on, on female, it can be other combinations. But I think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we had verses that were highly traumatizing to people, they wouldn't be able to just, you know, go to Tarawih or, you know, hear the Quran just being recited like that without, it could be very triggering to them. So I think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by reversing the, the gender of the figures while giving us still a story that means that this issue has to be front and center on our minds uh, from, you know, from, from, uh, from engaging with the Quran as we do, uh, I think maybe that's part of the the wisdom in making it. Um, but the other thing I say in my book is that Yusuf, we have to remember, Alayhi Salam is a he's on every other side of the power differential. He's on the, the sort of lower social status. Um, so he's a Hebrew in in Egypt. 
Okay, so he's an ethnic minority. He's a young person uh, in foster care. We could just say foster care like this. So he's, you know, doesn't, he's not surrounded by a family that can advocate for him. He's, um, you know, taken into the houses, he's enslaved. So he's, uh, you know, socioeconomically disadvantaged. So every other, if we look at him from this like intersectional perspective, the only, um, the, he, he is in fact very, you know, he, he, she's an aristocratic woman. She has the power apparatus behind her, which she uses. So I think in so many ways, the story, if we're just focusing on the gender of the two figures in, um, in the narrative, we're missing out on what Allah SWT is telling us um, about sort of the, maybe the plight of domestic workers that, or, you know, hotel um, cleaners or, you know, other, other people who by virtue of their circumstances or their occupation or whatever it is, are put in, um, in, in compromising um, circumstances. So I think it's a, we, we all have circumstances in our lives where um, we, we feel a, a pull to one or another type of moral wrong. And even taking it out of the, the context of sexuality, for, for instance, maybe we've felt like, oh, we'd like to be generous. And then we think, oh, well, wait, will I have enough for myself? Or we get an impulse to do something good. And then the wiswas or something in our nafs stops us from doing something good. That can happen, right? We can be stopped from doing something bad by listening to guidance from Allah SWT or guidance from one of our teachers or, or the like. So I think the story also just invites us to think in a broader sense as well about themes like, like, um, like per personally for our own spirituality, what are, what are circumstances, what, who are people we can surround ourselves with that help keep us on, on the moral straight path so that if we are in a situation that's potentially compromising, we have that moral character to uh, try to get out of it. So I think there's so many lessons in this story that go beyond the woman as temptress trope, that if we get mired in woman as temptress trope, we don't let the story kind of do its full work that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put it there um, to do, in, inshallah. So yeah, thank you so much for, for that, that really great question. Well, thank you for that answer. And um, I, and I, I, maybe maybe this is just me projecting, but I do feel that in your book, and even in this presentation, as you go along describing these uh, figures, you know, although we call them female figures, they are moral figures, mm -hmm. you know, whether they're wife of Lot, wife of Nuh, you know, they are immoral or they're wife of Pharaoh. These are moral, you know what I mean? So I think you're right in that at times we maybe get bogged down in looking at them as, you know, sort of the, the prototype of prototype female, prototype male, these are really moral dilemmas that exactly. affect all of us as humanity. So that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, I think Usama maybe sent you some um, questions in your chat. So we'll, I'll switch it over to you. Um, okay. And then Great. I'll follow up with if there are more questions. I do have one more, but I'll, I'll let you take the lead from here. Sure. I can read it out. The next one says, is there a significance with Maryam being the only woman addressed by name in the Quran? Uh, so let me let me take that first. This is a multi-part question. So let me take that first uh, question. So Allah says that Maryam is chosen above all the women, the women of, of all the worlds. And then it emphasizes once again that that chosenness. So twice it emphasizes the word chosen. And so I think one of the ways she's chosen is that she's the only woman figure mentioned by first name in, in the Quran that that's a uh, a distinct, you know, we could say among her fada'il, the, the ways that Allah SWT has preferred her. But there's also, you know, that in that she's the only woman we know of that has this miraculous um, birth without a male partner. So those are, I would say that, you know, among the many ways that Maryam is chosen, those are uh, potentially uh, two of them there. 
And the other wisdom is that she doesn't, in the Quranic account, she's, we don't hear any mention of, of a husband. We don't hear any mention of a, um, you know, a, 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 she wouldn't be referred to Imrat so-and-so uh, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is emphasizing in the story that she does not have a, a you know, a, a, um, a zawj. So I, I think that's one of the reasons too why why that first that first name they they say i once read in a hebrew um translation of a hebrew text that mar in like we have in arabic mar mean person that mariam uh can it you know obviously she's a hebrew woman um if we understand our sacred history so that that's part of the significance of the name could also mean like um it's a it's the plural it's like human being but in the plural form because the i am ending like elohim in in um in hebrew is uh plural so uh, there's a there's an interesting play potentially in her name meaning like okay here's a figure who we understand you know she uh she didn't need a spouse to to give birth so it's kind of like her name could could mean uh Two, two human beings, uh, or you could say like the virtue of Maryam is like the like of two human beings or something like this, and Allah knows best. So the second part of the question is, oh, good, there's a lot of questions coming into the chat. Okay, uh, so the next question, or the second part of that question, how are Muslim women living in spaces dominated by patriarchal frameworks and structures to read, interpret this in a way that is liberating, uplifting? Yeah, alhamdulillah, um, part of my motivation in writing the book was that I would regularly go about my ordinary life as a Muslim and come across things that were mildly chauvinistic, majorly chauvinistic, whether in the lived context that I was navigating or in some of the texts that I was reading. And so I wanted to try to live into my faith and understand the Quran in a way that didn't wasn't based on misogynistic understandings of um the world or human beings or um our our dean and so inshallah i everything i try to do and say i i try to make sure that it's very grounded in a in the quranic context and i think more and more there's other scholars out there male female scho male scholars female scholars who are putting out really, really wonderful scholarship that is not um, chauvinistic or patriarchal or or the like. So I think there's a lot of resources that are out there. Um, alhamdulillah, there's still a lot of material out there that that is the opposite, and so we do have to navigate it. I used to use the anytime I'd hear something that I uh, would would sense to be chauvinistic. I used to use that energy to put into my writing process. So I used to use it as a, a motivation. And then for a long period in my life, uh, the Muslim communities were, were so very wonderful that I hadn't heard anything chauvinistic or patriarchal in a long time. So then I sort of lost motivation to, to, to write on topics of women gender. So either way, whether it comes, you know, the, uh, um, the Prophet Sallallahu tells us that our affairs are, you know, the affairs of the Muslim are, are are all either way they're good either way we say alhamdulillah so when i hear um, sermons and the like that lift up the women in sacred history or women's pious women or or you know the many virtues that we know women have had in in our you know not just our sacred history but our our recent history i you know alhamdulillah and when i hear interpretations or um, people teaching in ways that are patriarchal or chauvinistic, then I also say alhamdulillah because it motivates me to study more and write more. So I would I would take it in in that in you know so the question how are Muslim women living in spaces dominated by patriarchal frameworks and structures to read interpret in a way that's liberating and uplifting? You know when you hear something, it don't don't uh, use your anger, don't put your anger out just like, or or that, that feeling of despair just out there, channel it into something productive um, like studying or like praying, like ask Allah to elevate this status of women in the world. 
um, or, or the like, inshallah. Uh, the next question, assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much for giving this discussion. I truly learned so much. Oh, that was sweet. Thank you. Jazakallah. <laughs> um, I have heard the hadith that there will be more women than men in the hellfire. And I feel a lot of people, and men in particular, use this as an excuse, reason to condemn women further. Yeah, is there any uh, counter argument or reasoning that can be given to explain this? I'm not remembering who has done a lecture on this, but I remember someone has a very good lecture out there. So if you know who, who I might be thinking of, feel free to put it in the chat. But this hadith, if we look at the circumstances of, of the, the wider context, it gives it a lot more clarity. This is not, in, uh, and according to the circumstances, meant to be, I think, a... Um, a theological teaching here. And I think the Prophet وسلم, the circumstances that I've understood that this hadith is that there, this was the Eid and um, the Prophet وسلم, everybody's in a very jovial mood. And he وسلم, is talking to a group of some of his closest companions, very, very, very um, righteous, pious women from among the Sahabiyat. And uh, I understood that this is the context of this is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sort of uh, joking back and forth with, with these women. And we often underestimate the, the, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did have a very powerful sense of humor. And um, people have written on this, uh, including my colleague Humayra Zayad, who's working on this, is working on the humor of, of the Prophet Muhammad. And so I don't, I'm not a Hadith scholar, so I'm not as, um, I can't speak with as much authority on this particular context, but that's what I understand it to be. I understand it to be the words of the Prophet وسلم, taken um, out of context when they weren't meant to be a theological a statement per se. Um, and um, if it's, yeah, if anybody remembers who has written on this, I invite you to put it into the chat. Oh, good, good. So uh, uh, someone else, right? Oh, oh, from Muslim space, this this might be um, um, Brother Malik Umar Malik. I, I know Dr. Jonathan Brown writes on, on his, this hadith in his book, Misquoting Muhammad. Yeah, uh, so we, we would have to check that out to see to see a bit more. There's so much work that has to be done on the Hadith tradition. Unfortunately, it's one of the places where misogyny thrives in, in the Islamic tradition uh, is interpretations of Hadith that either don't put the Hadith in context or that take parts of a Hadith and don't uh, fully um, like the, the hadith is out of the context in which the Prophet Muhammad was was saying it, or part of a hadith is given and the rest of the hadith isn't. So, inshallah, we need a book of um, really focused. There's um, there's a uh, there's a scholar. I don't have her work here with me right now, but Nimet, I think, is her first name. Barangziji, maybe is how you say it. If someone has it has the verse, uh, it's the book is, um, I think it's just called Women in the Hadith. Uh, yeah, I won't be able to find it now. Uh, it's uh, not, not on this shelf behind me, it's on a different shelf. So yeah, there's much to do on the Hadith um, tradition and, and I, I'm not a, a Hadith scholar as much as I am a, a Quran scholar and even as the we use the hadith to understand the Quran. Being a hadith scholar is its own separate um, discipline within Islamic studies. And so I try not to talk too much on things that I haven't spent a good deal of time studying. Oh, thank you. Yes, there it is. Women's identity and rethinking the hadith. Thank you so much, uh, Maria, Sister Maria. Thank you so much. Yeah. Do you have another question in your, in your chat box? Um, I don't see any other ones in mine. Okay, we have one that <clears throat> came to us. Um, gender is a highly politicized and confusing issue these days. 
Could you explain the various approaches by Islamic scholars to this and what differentiates you from others? Note 21 of introduction, of your introduction of the book, where you mentioned differences with Asma Barlas and, uh, and uh, Amina Wadud. Mm, okay, so this is a big question. Let me see what I can say in a, in a very concise format. So let's just get clarification on terms. And my Ramadan brain was very uh, loose and mixing terms. So I apologize for that. So generally, when we're talking about sex and biological sex, we're thinking male and female. And then when we're talking about gender, we're talking about the social ways in which the norms related to what it means to be female in a given society are expressed and what it means uh, in, um, to be male and what are the expectations, either explicit or subtle, that, that are acculturated ways of, of being. And so when we think about what, what are roles of wives or what are roles of husbands, most of this comes um, out of cultural contexts that that can be similar across cultures or or can be widely different. And so when we when we think about what the Quran is is how the Quran is dealing with biological sex on the one hand, we don't find differences per se between um, male and female. So that's where we have many of the verses stressing, you know, the one soul and, and this, this paradigm, um, like in, in um, Surah Al-Hujurat, verse 13, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the, um, you know, creating the human being male and female and um, into nations and tribes that we could get to know one another. This, this, these types of ethic is usually where you have sex-based conversations uh, in, in the Quran, discussions of male and female usually are signs of the uh, magnificent of magnificence of Allah's creation, and Allah's wisdom, etc. Uh, where we, we come, we find gender. So when we're dealing in the realm of gender, we can think about there's the girl child, there's the boy child, how does the Quran uh, talk about them similarly or differently. We could think about the um, the the child, not just the the child, but for instance, uh, verses that deal with inheritance. Um, what are the different ways to to divide up an inheritance? These are all based on social relationships, um, which change right based on context. So two children, three children, four children, and on to you know a grandmother. Uh, so th that's based on the social the social world. Now. When we come, when we come into think about the relationship between wives and and husbands and the way gender is expressed in wives and husbands, we see clear indications of the Quran of um, parity, reciprocity. There's uh, like Quran. Let me put this into the chat. Uh, Surah Al Baqarah, two hundred twenty-eight, is a verse that's oftentimes interpreted in a very chauvinistic context. But the verse is talking about men having a haq, like having a greater right. Uh, and then in, in matters of divorce specifically during the waiting period, which is that the man can, can uh, revoke the divorce during the waiting period, during those, those um, few months of where a woman doesn't get remarried. So you have verses that, um, verses in the legal tradition uh, like the, the, the both the Quranic verses that inform the legal tradition and legal tradition writ large, where we do find differences again in the gen in the realm of gender between wives and and husbands, but most fascinatingly, most of those differences relate back to core reproductive differences, which are themselves based in sex. So men and women, when we talk about what makes a good wife or what makes a good spouse in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a list in Surah Tahrim of, you know, what, how, if, if the, the two wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam don't behave, he'll replace them with, um, you know, spouses that are, and then there's a whole list of, of qualities. Those are the general qualities that make a good spouse. So when it comes to the realm of, of virtue ethics and the like, even gender in that context, gender in the context of virtue ethics for spouses, is radically uh, similar. 
So then the only difference in the realm of, of gender that the Quran is kind of emphatic about, about talking about has to do not with husbands and wives as um, in their social roles per se, um, but in their biological roles as you know, potential reproductive partners, meaning versus the deal with divorce, there's a waiting period for women. Why? Because she might be pregnant. Um, maybe she discovers she's pregnant, the husband, maybe they want to reconcile, right? Or versus, for instance, that deal with funds that are given to a woman as the meher, as the bridal gift. Why? Because it's a, a level of social security for a woman whose body uh you know could could uh you know could become radically transformed in this process of of marriage through through pregnancy so there's a direct um it all of the rulings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us that differentiate between husbands and wives are not based on differences in virtue are not based on differences in like a, um, they're they're tied to the reproductive realm. So you know, Allah knows best exactly, like the the wisdom behind that. But given that we have to, Allah created us as spouses, as as pairs, you know, as wedge, to um, reproduce through those pairs, or to find rest in those pairs. That even if we don't reproduce through those pairs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts guidelines in place for, for protecting both um, anything and any of the fruits of the womb, so to speak, but also the, the different psychological approaches where, for instance, women, the, you know, the, the patterns of you know, ovulation, the hormone patterns are different, Im impacts mood differently, impacts all, um, all types of things differently. You know, men also, their hormonal uh, structure is slightly different. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, according to our, our constitution, which again, doesn't differ in the realm of morality, spirituality at all, but does differ in the realm of our physicality, as as relates to to reproduction, I mean, even the size of men, like in general, like a rijal kawumun al nisa, we could we could interpret the the qiyam the kawm the 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 qam like the, that root as being you know that root means to stand or to stand erect, and so it it could even be a reference to men's physical size generally. Uh, if we take like an overall human average, we do find that men are on average much bigger because of their hormones and testosterone and the like. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invites us to look at the material realm that's around us and, you know, understand the wisdom in the Quran through what we see in, in, in the world. Uh, so that hopefully it's a little bit on sex and gender. Now, where I differ with other commentators maybe is that I am utterly um, beholden to like the the meanings of of the Quran I don't um Amina Wadid has in her later work uh an idea of of just saying no to 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 the Quran so I don't really adopt that sort of of paradigm um I say if a verse doesn't adhere to my own understanding it's my understanding that is short, not the Quran. So uh, that's one of the ways. I think, um, let me, I don't want to talk too much. I want to hear more of your questions. But I'm going to put in the chat here, Abla Hassan. Those of you who are curious about verse 434 is one of verses, the verses that's oftentimes taken in very patriarchal contexts. Abla has a really wonderful YouTube video that takes us through some of the misinterpretations of, of that verse and um, provides us with a more coherent reading, I think. So um, that's that's definitely something to check out if you're interested in 
kind of what what women scholars in particular have have been doing. But another one, I'm just putting some names into the chat who are doing amazing work. Uh, Hadi Mubarak, I think many of you might know her work as well to check out. And Mahjabeen Dalla. Uh, there's a book by Mahjabeen is working on, um, on, on uh, Sayyidina Fatima and uh, Roshan. Um, oh my gosh, my Ramadan brain is forgetting on her on her last name. Um, Roshan, she's at Agnes Scott. I don't know why my brain is is cutting out, but uh, she has a book out on temporary marriage from a, a Shia perspective and thinking through the legacy of interpretation around temporary marriage. There's so many uh, great works coming out that I think uh, are really advancing our understanding of the Quran, the Islamic legal tradition. Uh, Zahra Ayubi comes to mind. Um, she, Zahra Ayubi is at Dartmouth and she's working on uh, Islamic moral uh, understandings and gender, trying to show um, the... Uh, the ways in which some bias has crept into the tradition in terms of thinking about women's morality. Uh, let's see. Yes, those are just some names. Yeah, thank you, Asma Lam Rabat. Yeah, thank you, Fatima. So she has a book. I actually have that one here, I think. Uh, Women and Men in the Quran. Oh, yeah. Here. Uh, so these are two of translations. These are from the French into English. Um, Maryam. Francois Serrah has done this translation, and uh, Munira Salim Murdoch has done this translation. So, great reflection there. Yeah, so much, so much scholarship. So, if you have other other scholars here, and I'm I'm stressing female scholars, but David Soliman, Jalajil. Um, might have gotten the spelling wrong, has a beautiful work out on women's leadership. And I say beautiful because it dissects some of the, the chauvinistic and misogynistic tropes related to women's leadership that are we can find in our intellectual tradition and um, very clearly goes through kind of the, the problematic nature of, of some of those tropes. Oh, what a great list of um, of resources, and I guess maybe homework for all of us this week. Um, we're, you know, I think from Muslim Spaces perspective, we're especially excited to check out that YouTube video. Um, back in 2018, we as a kind of a book club read Men in Charge, where that really, mm -hmm. that entire book delved into 434. So I'm glad that you touched on it. I'm glad that you've shared a resource. Um, really quick, I'd love to just uh, poll uh, the the audience. If there are any other questions from anybody, um, if you'd like to just either unmic or or sorry unmute or raise your hand as we are just wrapping up or down to the last five minutes or so. Um, I don't see anything else. I don't. Think I, I should say a little disclaimer that the, those are the names that just came to my mind right now, and I know I've forgotten people and uh, you know probably very obvious names that that should be there that I didn't get a chance to add. So um, I I should uh, like ask people's permission or, or you know uh, sorry for my shortcomings and. Oh, uh, no. Yeah, and if I said anything else, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, show me the, the correct answer so that um, it's not part of my account to my hisab that I've taught something that's wrong. So may, may Allah reward all of you for Ramadan, uh, during Ramadan, inshallah, and accept your standing and your fasting. And may uh, Make Space continue to be this really beautiful, exciting platform. And uh, Jazakallah, Shadia, for... Uh, Jazakallah khairan for um, making this possible. And okay. uh, and Ustaz Sama Malik, uh, wonderful to have your presence here too. No, Jazakallah for, for being here, for sharing your wisdom, sharing your time. Um, just a quick note, you know, maybe to Maria's um, question earlier, uh, with, you know, when we come across 
some of the um, maybe patriarchal or chauvinistic um, claims that are that are projected that might uh, undermine women or target women. Remember, it's books like Dr. Ibrahim's, right? That's the best counter. So, I mean, I will plug this, get her book. It's an incredible book. Um, it's not very long. It's something that should be on every bookshelf because it will arm you with the, with the knowledge from the Quran. Nothing can, can overrule the Quran. So you might hear these hadith, but remember, this is what the Quran is saying. Um, it's a fantastic book and we're so very blessed to have you here. So I thank you. I know we're all looking forward to next Sunday. Um, if you come up with uh, any other resources, you know, put them on post-its and we'll share them in the thread next week. Uh, everybody, this is an interactive um, program. So please do come with your questions. Um, even if you just want to put comments um, in the chat box, you know, which female figure mentioned today was your favorite or one that you're excited to learn more about. Um, inshallah, everybody, we will see you back here next Sunday. We will have the recording up later on this afternoon, inshallah. And um, I thank you all. I wish you all a blessed, blessed day 11 of Ramadan. Mm -hmm. SubhanAllah, how fast it goes. MashaAllah, nearly halfway. Nearly halfway. This is the hard part, right? This is the hump, the middle mm -hmm. third. Everybody take care. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.